It's, um, it's my absolute pleasure now to, uh, to introduce the second guest speaker of today, and that's uh, Uncle Harold Hunt. Um, I've known Harold Hunt now since the 1980s when we worked together, um, and, uh, and now, again, I've recently met him here through Nepean Hospital. He started a career in health services in the 1970s, and Mr Hunt of St Mary's was awarded with a Medal of the Order of Australia in 2014 for his service to Indigenous communities in New South Wales. Uh, Uncle Harold is well known for his work in cross-cultural communication and Indigenous health. Uh, he's worked as an educator and counsellor in the area of substance abuse for the Redfern Community <coughs> Health Centre, for the New South Wales Health Commission, uh, and the Department of Corrective Services. Uh, Uncle Harold left school in 1940 and moved to Sydney in 1971, where he began to work with the New South Wales Health Commission. More recently, Uncle Harold is regularly invited as a guest speaker and is active in advocacy through uh, community submissions and representation at government forums on health and justice issues. So, Uncle Harold, welcome to Nepean Hospital. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction and I want to say congratulations on the previous speakers and I was all set on what I was going to say here this morning and then listening to the other speakers and then looking at that beautiful film, I mean a bit of a twirl, I wouldn't know where to start. I looked at that, the, uh, <coughs> up there they had Harold and OAM and I thought they I wonder they didn't put my name there because my younger son said, you know what that stands for, that OAM? And I said, I think so. He said, it means old Aboriginal man. <laughs> and I thought, well, <laughs> you ought to put my age there. <coughs> Just a second and I'll yeah. get rid of all of this. There you go. Yeah, but anyway. Uh, <coughs> you don't have to know my age, but it's 89 actually, I turned 89 this year, but <coughs> yes, I'm a descendant of the Mullingupper people from far western New South Wales, what we call the corner country, which is, starts off about 100 odd miles west of Burke through to the border, the, west, the South Australian border, Queensland border, I mean, and uh, runs down from near Tipperborough through to Lake Frome in, the, in South Australia, so it's a big lump of land. <clears throat> and uh, so that's the mob I belong to. And uh, a few interesting things have happened. Uh, a young Scotsman came out here in the 1800s and uh, he took himself an Aboriginal wife. So that, that was the beginning of that uh, together and they had a daughter who, who uh, happened to be my grandmother who I got married. But it's interesting that last year one of my grandsons went over and he married a Scottish girl in Scotland, actually. <laughs> so they did the full circle. <laughs> the, um, they met out here, but the wedding was held there, over there for various reasons. And, uh, <clears throat> it's been an interesting journey. Talk about reconciliation. And, and uh, it, it, as I said here before this one, it's, it's a two-way thing all the way through. And the... Uh, 12 steps of AA, step 8 has made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And I think it says it all. But a couple of little things that uh, happened. My grandfather, Jack Quayle, he did a lot of contract work, tank sinking and fencing and roving and that, so whatever any of those big stations he uh, he uh, worked on, there was all those other Aboriginals just to go and camp around there with him because they were always an opportunity for work, but anyway, they used to live off, uh, there was, there's a scour three miles from down the Paru River from Monaring, and uh, they lived off kangaroo, emu, porcupine, fish, the whole lot. And anyway, they killed a bullock one time, and uh, one of the mob, and uh, he didn't like Jack Quayle, my grandfather, so he went up to the local cop, and he said, hey, Jack Quayle, and it, well, they killed one of Mr. Barton's bullock, you've got to lock him up. And uh, anyway, the cop said, well, I better do something about it. So he summonsed him, and then 
The day of the court came, there was, you know, there's no magistrates in that country, it's all JPs, but the only JP available happened to be the owner of the Bullock. So he sat up there and the uh, charge was read out and then a bit of evidence and then he dismissed the case, he said insufficient evidence. So that was a bit of a, a good turnaround. And, uh, <clears throat> but the, another incident, uh, my parents separated when I was about eight and uh, we came to, we lived in a, the only house, real house we ever lived in, we lived in for about four years between Broken Hill and Tipperborough. But we came to White Cliffs for a while and then uh, got a bit of schooling there and I didn't see anything wrong with it. We were all, there was a good mix of kids. And uh, then we were told on such and such a date there's going to be a very special man here. There's an inspector coming, he's got to be, make sure everybody's right and uh, then be smart and quiet and behave yourselves. And this very special man turned up and he's in a three piece suit and everything. And he was going along and he was pointing it out. And uh, these here, yeah, these are abos, the full bloods, and these are the nice khaki looking ones in one. What are they? Are they Polynesians or something? No, I don't know. No, I think they're abos too, part Aboriginal or something, as was mentioned here this morning. But I was for years, and uh, I grew up to know that there was, uh, you know, there were uh, people mixed blood Aboriginals, which was such a shameful thing that a lot of them claimed to be Maoris and Indians and that. And then I think these Poly have Polynesians. I wonder what it is. I wonder if it's all right to be one of them. <coughs> but uh, anyway, that was my first knowledge of the racism and the. Uh, oh, but uh, <coughs> I'm getting a bit shaky in the legs, but the. Uh, but anyway, we looked at that, and the other thing that came out of it then, I've got a copy of the uh, school register where it had uh, the d different religious denominations, had all the kids' details, as you all know, and then they had the religious denominations, they had English, Church, Roman, Catholic, and Abbos, and uh, I've got a copy of that at home. So this was the beginning of us. Uh, thanks for that, Lord. <coughs> and. Uh, Thank you. What? Yep, there, 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 that, that was the beginning of all this, this racism stuff because I saw a mixture of people getting on and they were, <coughs> we, we got on with some people, some uh, I say Aboriginals fought with others and got friends with others, we fought with white kids in it. But, but there was another incident, um, uh, as I said, mum and dad had separated and we finished up on a four acre block of land at Wanari. It was uh, right on the Paru River, and uh, we lived there in tin shacks. We built out of petrol tins, and there was plenty of those around in those days. It was before the days of 44-gallon drums. But Mum and the kids, there was, she had five kids left, and they were coming off the bridge with our goats and potty sheep and that sort of thing, and the postmaster was in a hurry to go, but he was sweetheart and the graziest daughter up the river. and. Uh, Anyway, he didn't stop and he knocked one of the sheep over and that when the sheep went up the road, but then he screamed out at Mum, hey, Jim, get your snotty nose kids and dogs off the road or I'll run you all over. So she walked over, he's in an open top touring car and she asked him what he said and he was smart enough to repeat it. <laughs> so he got himself a smack in the mouth and uh, Mum was a big woman and she gave her a backhand. Anyway, away he went. So the kids got excited and they said, he'll go and tell Mr. Tarrant, won't he? Mr. Tarrant was the local cop. And he'll go and tell Mr. Tarrant, Mum, and you'll get locked up. We won't have to go to school then, will we? She said, no, I don't, I don't think that'll happen. But uh, he did summon Mum and uh, some of his mob there are crazy. Jack Gibbons tried to talk him out, but he said, you'll make a fool of yourself, Ted. This woman's more got more respect here than you were, but no, he went ahead with it and uh, <coughs> anyway, uh, again they had a JP of course in those days and mum's in the courtroom and there was her and uh, the, uh, what's the, name? the postmaster and then his uncle who tried to talk about it and uh, a very unpopular publican, uh, Frank Kennedy, so the, uh, 
Uh, this was dealt with, and the charge was ready out. Assault, how do you plead? Mum said guilty. So the JP looks through the books and what, you know, what was so easy. Says, well, you'll be sentenced to two pound or four days imprisonment. And Mum said, well, I've got no money, so I suppose I'll have to go to jail. And uh, I'm sure some of you men to look after me garden and me fowls and goats and me five kids and make sure they get to school and everything like this. So there was dead silence in there and nothing else happened. So Mum said, well, if not, nothing's going to happen, I might as well go home. So she turned around <laughs> <laughs> and walked out and this unpopular publican followed her along and he said, here, Mrs. Hutt, give him this two quid. Mum said, I've got no money and I don't know when the boys will be able to send me any, so I don't know. And he said, I don't want it back. He said, it's worth more than two quid to see what happened there. So these, are, <laughs> well, these are the sort of things that happen and we've, we've had good and uh, difficult relationships all around. And uh, The other thing I saw in there is the late Bill Ferguson. And I, I'd actually seen that man when, he, when I was a kid and he travelled around a little green touring car out back and he set up an Aboriginal Progress Association and I've got a letter at home where he'd wrote, written to Mum and asked her if she'd join this thing to get away from the protection board, the Aboriginal Progress Association. And it was two shillings a year, actually, membership. But uh, it went all right for a good while and then the secretary treasurer, and it was being sent into him, he was in work, he was a, an Aboriginal bloke and uh, Anyway, he had to go to Sydney on some business and he'd come home on a brand new utility. So that was the end of the Progress Association. So uh, I've seen all that type of thing happening over and over. And uh, it's, uh, we, we talk about racism. This is a very racist country and racism is rife today. I'm very conscious of it, I'm sensitive to it, I can pick it in but I'm no longer a victim of it. I can identify it with it in its many forms, you know. Oh, have you met Harold here? G'day, Harold, how are you going? Good, thanks, mate. Yeah, I, I had a good mate years ago in the army. He was an Aboriginal. He was a great, he was a nice bloke too. And then, then someone else said, oh yeah, I had a great bloke. He was a good bloke too, yes. He didn't spit all over the place. So he was Aboriginal too. And they tell, immediately they tell you they knew another Aboriginal. And uh, I know, uh, We've had these things, Edison. We had no, uh, we, we got a lot of that sort of stuff and, and it's still out there every once in a while. And I've had people say, you Aboriginal? And it depends on the situation, how I feel about that person, why they ask and I'll often say, well, what's your interest? You know, I wouldn't have, you've got a white skin, I wouldn't have a clue what breed you are and I'm not even interested. <laughs> so you've got to tell it because we grew up, we were bungs, niggers, coons, darkies, abbas, all of those things and we had no way of addressing it. And then in this little town of Wanaring, we, uh, I reckon I, I, I was the first person ever to break the four minute mile. Was <clears throat> in those days the post office used to be open on Saturday afternoons and my mother and all her brothers, they were all musical, they played accordions and mouth organs, juice harps, banjos and baboons and all that. And then the policeman's wife, Mrs. Tarrant, Edna Tarrant, her and mum were great mates and she was a pianist and they were both horsey women so as to go riding together. They'd ride in the local races and everything. <coughs> so, uh, but anyway, uh, I was in the post office, I was about 12 this afternoon and uh, there was a woman there said to the postmistress, and Who, who's playing for the dance tonight? She said, oh, so I suppose Mrs Hunt and her brother was playing, do we need those niggers in the hall? Well this nigger was out the door and he took the message home to mum and I reckon I would have broken the four minute mile that day. But <laughs> I got there. And later on Mrs Tarrant came down to uh, talk to mum about it, about playing for the dance and she didn't, so mum relayed the message and she said, well, I'll, I'll go back and I'll tell the, Val the Brown, the, you know, that the dance will go on whether she's there or not, but it won't go on without you people. So that's, and we used to, um, then they, they sold raffle tickets for black fellas, white fellas, and anybody going there to build a new hall. And when they built this new hall, 
Then there was a big meeting about who could go in there, and they said, well, there'd be no blacks in the hall. Now, the only blacks that ever went into that hall were the Hunt family. And uh, there were other Aboriginals used to come and go there to an ironing, and some would stay up a few weeks or a few months, but we were the only permanent family there. But we were the only Aboriginals that ever, and we never danced, or often tried to dance with anyone outside our own family, our brothers and sisters, and with mum, that's the only, so... Uh, and here there was two graziers there, and one of them said, well, I'll, my job to sell the tickets, I'll sell a ticket to whoever's got, got the money. And the other bloke said, well, he's given me the job of doorkeeper, I'll let anyone in that's got a ticket. But one of these blokes said to one of his sons, he said, you're a mate of Harold's, tell him what's happening. And anyway, so they told him, and, and named the person, that it was this Val's brother, actually, Laurie. And uh, they were very redneck, and, but anyway, we went up and Mum was always keen about the dress. We had, had to dress immaculately all the time, that's a big one. And uh, anyway, we went up and Mum and the girls went into the hall and uh, Eric, my brother and I, we, we stood around outside and just waited in the hall. And when the opportunity came, when uh, this lorry came out, we waited right in the doorway and all the light and we just told him we wanted to talk to him and we challenged him about it. He denied it and we said, uh -huh. there's no argument, we know what happened, but uh, if you don't want us in there, it's your job to keep us out. End of story. So that one, he skipped your way, we finished with you. And uh, later on, then when supper came around, Eric said, oh, hey, come and have a look at this. And uh, anyway, at supper time, they used to take the supper around on trays and here's a big lorry in front of mum and the girls with a tray of cakes. So uh, we had that sort of, that was back in the 40s, I think. But then later on at the little town of Ingonia, out 60 miles north of Burke, uh, there was a dance on there. And mum was at, in well, 60s in those days, and she was still on back, and she came out for us for Berkeley. She just loved to be where there was music and dance, and she was sitting up, and uh, anyway, there was some young rednecks in the pub, and uh, Eddie Schofield was the public, and mum had worked for him at one time, but anyway, uh, and my brother Eric and I, we were in there, but uh, these two, there was four or five of these young graziers there and they said, how are we going to get that gin out of the hall? And Eddie's public said, come here, I'll tell you. You want to get her out of the hall? And uh, yeah, it's easy, it cost you a couple of beers. Oh yeah, what will do? He said, see those two blokes there? Just go and buy them a beer and tell them what you want done. <laughs> and they said, all right, who are they? That's the that's two boys with two sons, you know. Go and have a try of that. So they checked out, they reckon they'd better leave, let that gin stay in the hall. So that type of thing, we've had to deal with all the way through, but as I said, no longer a victim of it. And it was mentioned here this morning by someone about, you know, we, we don't hold on to these things on that screen. There's no uh, hatred. And mum, mum was strong and she would stand up and fight and she had, she's had to do that. Uh, and have fist fights with men, if you don't mind. So, uh, but she was in, in, incapable of hate, and I know she'd be criticising somebody that I didn't like, and I'd say, yeah. and another thing about him, mum, and she said, now listen, son, I thought, oh God, when she lose that word son, that's the end of my <laughs> argument. You, know? you don't do that, you don't carry on. It's been a good journey, there's no doubt about it, and uh, it's been a rough journey, it's a hard one, and as uh, Kevin said a while ago, I've done a, a whole range of things because I've uh, I always wanted to do something different. I wonder, and uh, and I always wanted to be the best at it. And I found that you can do most things, you know, with a bit of common sense and some mistakes, and you're up and away. And uh, it doesn't matter what you're trying to do; you'll be criticised, and uh, you get the the what if of a tribe, you know, what if this happens, what if that's happened? I thought, well, well, what if it doesn't happen? So uh, that, that, that's the way I got through with it. And I joined the Health Commission in, uh, I came to Sydney in 71 actually, and uh, uh, anyway, I, I got a couple of jobs at 
friends that got me down here got me doing some fencing for a start, and then I got a job driving for, for Trico Steel, a, a steel selector in the firm. So I was a paid tourist all over Sydney. That was good, didn't it? The New South Wales Health Commission uh, started to uh, decided they'd start uh, employing recovered alcoholics to train as counsellors to deal with alcoholism, and the other drugs weren't mentioned in those days of the 70s, so uh, anyway, I joined up and uh, we, we did the training course. There's about 12 or 14 of us, I think, and uh, we covered alcoholics and uh, when we finished the training, we got out there and, and when I got out there, I found that what I was taught didn't work. You know, they say, well, you say this and Charlie will say that and then he'll say something and you'll say this and you say, well, did Charlie didn't say what he was supposed to say, so <laughs> it was... And at the end of a the year, there were only six of us left with the burnout and everything. So uh, I got on there and <coughs> I moved into, I had a shearer and sheds and drove in camps. I was a shearer for 20 years and um, I uh, come out of that and then to get me thrown into a, a team at Redfern House, a, a com community me mental health team. And there were psych nurses and psychos and so psychologists and everything and the, the psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Dorothy Crowell, she was in charge and I'm trying to, and the language totally foreign to me, I never had a clue what they were talking about and I used to come in of the mornings and I had a, an office where, in, right up in the attic and I'd come in and I'd go straight up in there and there was a, a psychologist just shared with me, she was hardly ever there and I was pleased with that and then two days a week we'd have staff meeting one day and then we'd have uh, something to talk about our clients and I'd stand up there and I'd read the Desert Rider and uh, some other thing and then I'd say the Serenity Prayer and I'd, <sighs> they can't hurt me now and that's how I'd enter that room and get through but anyway uh, I got a bit chosen and then I heard, <clears throat> I started to feel my way around a little bit and I heard there was a uh, heard the word protocol and I thought, well, that sounds like a racehorse, and, and I'm not a gambler, so I won't worry too much about that, and, uh, and I didn't. And uh, when we were trained, it was arranged that we could go into the prison, into Long Bay Jail, and work there. But then when the time came, there was a psychiatrist in there, didn't want any of us, he put up all sorts of things. So I, uh, the blocks, and, and then we got about it, and then I thought, oh, good. So I found out where the Commissioner correct for Corrective Services were well, well, in uh, the big building down the marketplace there somewhere. And uh, there was a nurse on uh, work experience, and she was working with me at the time. And I said, well, go down there. She said, you can't. I said, yes, we can. So I went in and uh, saw the girl at the desk, and she said, uh, I'll see if I can get you a, a meeting with his secretary. And I said, oh, I want to see the boss. She said, no. So when I saw his secretary, she said, you, you don't have a, an appointment. I said, oh, she said, you have to make an appointment, but I said, I want to see him today. Well, she said, it doesn't work like that. And I saw his name over the door, and I said, well, he go, he go home tonight, he'll fall over me because I'm going to be sitting there. <laughs> so she went red in the face, and she went in, and she tapped in the door, and then she came back, and she said, he'll see you if you're prepared to wait for an hour. I said, that's not a problem. So we went over, and we sat in Hyde Park for the hour, and. Uh, this nurse said, well, you got some front, and I said, there's something, I was a grave digger for 18 months, and I learned there, you start at the top. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, we went back, and we got in, and we got a good 20 minutes with him. And word got back then to my, uh, the regional director, and then he, get, he gets, attacks Dorothy Crowell, who's this clown you got up here that's <laughs> going and seeing commissioners? So, <laughs> Anyway, Dorothy come past me one morning and she walked up and put a finger in my face and she said, Harold, every bit of correspondence you've got blood from me, she said, I want it on my desk when I come back and I want you there personally. She said, a bloody hide of it. And away she went. I thought, oh, Jesus, that's the end of my health commission job. But she went there and she came back and I went and saw her and she asked, why, did, why didn't you discuss it with me? I said, Dorothy, because you would have been another obstacle. So she said, well, Harold, don't you ever, now I'll reword that, if you ever decide you want to do something like that again, come and discuss it with me, will you? And I said, right. So 
That was the turn. That was a big help. So I knew I had my boss on side. I had a boss with common sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, I went through there. I moved out of that. I did a heap of things. I've traveled around Australia since then. I moved sideways into uh, corrective services and because I was with the Health Commission. They created a position for me and they called me out. Um, it was a field I was in, in alcoholism. They called me out and, and alcoholism liaison officer. Well, the hardest part of that was learning to spell liaison. <laughs> <laughs> They gave me a car, they gave me a desk in that office, I'd click my fingers like that and I'd have an airline ticket on my desk. I went out, I, I worked with the, the regional uh, 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 people that coordinated or something in, with the, uh, in all the centres and I did quite a lot of work and I was happy with it and I got a lot of support. But I could not discuss my work with my seniors I wrote very good reports, about, very detailed reports about everything, but my bosses never read them. I could have went around there and travelled around, stayed in motels, played a bit of golf, a little bit of fishing. It wouldn't have mattered. So, but I, I, I kept going on that, and uh, eventually they, uh, I, I moved sideways later on, and there was a, there was an Aboriginal organisation who made funding available to train at Aboriginal Probation Parole Officers and it was a 12 months course. For non-Aboriginal it was a three months course but you had to have a degree in sociology and or psychology so you couldn't get in but anyway uh, I moved sideways and I think I was Australia's second Aboriginal Probation Parole Officer girl from before me, I forget her name now but I did meet her and uh, so I moved in and then later on they found out that we can get it. So they cut out the 12 months thing. Because I was there four months and I said to my training officer, better give us a briefcase and put me in the court. Because I, you know, he said, you've got 12 months. So I said, 12 months, I'll become a permanent trainee. I don't want it. He said, well, we'll try it. So they threw me into court and I, I got through with it all right. As I said. A bit of bluff and a bit of like and, and a few mistakes and uh, you're up and, uh, up and away. So life's become very, very good and, and then uh, a long run. I know it's a, it's a long story. I'd better shut up and give someone else a go. But uh, <laughs> that uh, that portrait you've got there, a, a bloke. I've, I've done some writing. I've, I've wrote my mother's life story, and that went all right. I have another little book, but uh, then I'm, I've just finished writing my own autobiography. But I was uh, my youngest daughter who helped me with it. She's up at, on the Sunshine Coast. But that, the artist that did that portrait, for that is the view you that see it out there, and it, it's uh, David Newman White. Him and his wife went up to the Sunshine Coast, but he came back earlier. When his wife Leslie was coming back, the woman sitting beside read a book on art, so they got talking about art. And then Leslie said, well, my husband does a lot of that, and he's looking for a subject that might do some modelling, so this lady happened to be my writing agent of all people. She said, oh, I know someone, so she got in touch with me and I got in touch with David Newman White and we've been mates ever since and uh, he's done a couple of portraits of me to the Archibald but they've never hung any of his work in 30 years but it's, it's good stuff and it's hanging out there in there. And now the big one that showed up there, the big long one, it's, it's, he calls that the life and times of Harold Hunt. And he's got my whole life in there, and the stuff is drawn into that thing that he's worked out for himself that I, I didn't even tell him about. And he said there was no plan. He said I just started drawing and drawing and drawing over and over. He's got me, he's got horses, he's got dogs, he's got yabbies, he's got the whole works. But I'm rambling on him now that it's been a, a great, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great honor, a great pleasure to be here with, with you people today. And, uh, Thank you all very much. I've got a few contacts here that have uh, been getting me around and ringing me along and letting me keep me up to date with things. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, anyway, that, that's enough for me. And thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you. So.